So welcome everyone. I really, my goal is to make this a very practical and helpful presentation. Um, so I hope you can take a lot away from it. So a couple of little goals for today. Really what I want to make sure that we do is we outline uh, the difference between uh, how we define a disability between early intervention and preschool services. Um, touch on the different essential components of an individualized education plan and then really focus on what the PWS specific needs are that should be addressed in the varied sections of the IEP. I'm going to do my best not to lapse into what my husband calls psychobabble and start using a bunch of acronyms, um, but hopefully I will not do that. If I do, please feel free to put a note in the chat box or something just to try and catch me if I do it. So when you look at the difference between early intervention and preschool services, um, the law that, of the land that we're looking at is the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. Um, the distinctions really look at kind of that dividing line um, of three years of age. So some of the big differences are in early intervention, what they look at is if there's a developmental delay in several different areas, or, and I, I really emphasize the word or, there's a diagnosed physical or mental condition that has a high probability of resulting in a developmental delay. So what you find is that the model is really a lot more medical in its emphasis. So you'll find that you can have a diagnosis and if there's a chance that your child's gonna have a really significant delay, you can a lot of times get services. You're just automatically eligible. Once you hit that three-year um, kind of line, and you start looking at more preschool and eventually school age services. They're a lot more specific about what they're looking for in terms of providing services. So IDEA outlines that you need to either have an intellectual disability, hearing impairment, speech or language, visual impairment. Um, it lists off a couple different things. Obviously prader willi is not specifically listed there, but certainly prader willi could align with several of those different things there. But you start looking at those different areas of disability and then it says and. And that and is the big thing that you really need to emphasize and look at is that you're looking at is there a reason or a significant area of deficit that you need to have special education or a related service to address that. Um, and the way I kind of look at it is when you're having that evaluation done to transition from early intervention to preschool services. I think we've spent so much time really trying to help our kids make progress and show success and we're just we're celebrating all those things and we really don't want to hear that there's still those areas of deficit. But the reality is that you know low scores on those evaluations are okay because what it means is that there's something that's just it's still an area of need. It's something that needs to be worked on. And so, because if there isn't an area of deficit, then there's no point in providing services. Special education isn't necessary. Um, so I really encourage parents to think about, yep, you know what your child's successes are. You know what their strengths are. Um, you know that they're there, but let's think about where we still need to grow. Um, and also really think about, a lot of times we put a lot of structures and supports and we pre-teach and we prep things. Um, you wanna think about what your child would do if they were left completely to their own devices with no adult support, no prep for a situation. Um, and if you're looking at a child where you're like, wow, you know, I do this and this and this and this to make sure that they can be successful, then you wanna make sure that your testing and your discussion about your child's needs is reflective of all the things that they need to be successful. Um, because if they can't do it on their own, then it's not a mastered skill. So in terms of an individualized education program, which is what you're going to be looking at having within the preschool, it's really a written statement that just includes everything that's going to address those unique educational needs. Um, so the way that I've laid it out here on the slide isn't necessarily how the IEP form in your state is going to be laid out. Um, but professionally, this is kind of the progression that I work through in terms of writing an IEP. So I'm sharing it with you that way. So um, what you do is you kind of start out thinking about where is my child at in terms of their, ac their current performance. So academic achievement, learning characteristics, their social needs, their physical development and their management. We'll flush all those out in a few minutes. But when you look at where are they at right now, what can they do? Um, that's going to say, well, what are our goals then? Where do we want to go from here? So you want those goals to be something that are measurable. So you need to know, you know, 
how do we know when we've gotten there? So it can't just be some arbitrary, you know, they'll play, you know, with other kids. Well, how do you measure that? What does that mean? How can you, how can you really look at that? And you want to set a goal that's going to be reasonably accomplished within the next year. And then you kind of move from, okay, here's where we're at. Here are the goals that we've set. Now, what services do they need to get there? So then you start talking about, you know, what are the teacher services? What are the related services? What modifications do they need to their environment? Um, what do staff need to know? Do they need training? Do they need professional development? Um, and then that kind of leads on into the idea of, you know, how much participation do they have with non-disabled children? Um, there are things that if you went and you looked at IDEA and it gave you the mandated parts of an IEP, there are just some things that aren't necessarily um, things that you need to worry about just yet. So like transition or um, the age of majority, things like that, those are down the road, but these are really the highlights that you need to focus on right now. So I'd like you to take a moment for self-reflection um, and really kind of start to think about a couple of the questions um, because how you approach the meeting and how you approach your needs can definitely help drive your approach to both the school staff and the expectations that they in turn have of your child. So for example, what are your concerns and your biggest worry for your child? It could be the Prader Willi related medical concerns. It could be behavioral. It could be the hyperphagia. Um, you know, what, what are the things that are really, what are, what's stressing you out? You know, where do you see the, the need for growth? What do you really want to see them be able to do in the short term? Because I think that we all have goals and things that we want to see happen, you know, years in the future. Um, and the reality is, you know, you're going to be building building blocks at this point in time, but you're not really going to be shooting for the stars in the moment. You're, you're just setting the framework. This is a really vital question that I'm tossing out there, and it's a difficult one to kind of think away, and it's a really, um, but it can really impact you. So when I say, do I believe that hyperphagia is a behavior that can be trained away or a symptom of a physical drive? Um, the reason I believe this is so important is because it's going to define how the teachers want to interact with your child. If you believe that the hyperphagia is just a behavior that, you know, they're going to be able to get over it and get past it in the future, the message you're sending to the teachers is that that's a behavior that they're going to have to just address. Um, there should be consequences for it. Um, and you just need to work with it and try and eliminate it. But if you see it as a symptom, it's a physical drive, then you start talking a lot more about um, supports and modifications to the environment. If you're saying this is something that my child is dealing with, they can't control it, um, we need to make sure that their environment meets their needs versus potentially punish them for a behavior, um, it makes a huge difference. And then one of the biggest th questions is gonna be, how do I describe all of this in a way that's relevant to classroom instruction? Um, as parents, we've been very focused in those early years on medical and meeting their needs. Um, and as they set foot into school, we have to start thinking about how is this going to impact them in terms of their learning and how do we describe it that way? Because a teacher is, you know, as caring and compassionate as they're going to be, the bottom line is they want to see kids learn. So we're always looking for ways to draw those connections um, between a student's learning and their needs. So one of the first things that we really want to talk about is we want to make sure that throughout the IEP, um, there's Prader Willi specific information. Um, so one of the big areas in the present levels is academic achievement and learning. Obviously at preschool, they're not going to have a lot of academic readiness skills. That's the whole point of where you're going. Everybody's going to be working on that. So you're not going to want to talk about, well, they don't know their letters and their numbers. Well, no student going into preschool knows all their letters and numbers. So you want to talk about what's different for your child that they need to work on to be able to, to perform at the level of their peers. So for a lot of our kids, it's that speech, their, you know, their articulation, how well can they be understood, their language, like do they understand what's being said to them or can they actually convey their wants and needs in a very functional way? Um, it's sometimes it's like those soft skills for learning. So could they sit at circle? Could they, you know, pay attention to the same thing that an adult is or that the other kids around them? 
can they participate in an adult directed task or when everybody else sits down to circle are they just off and wandering or not paying attention or um, acting out behaviorally and there again that ability to remain engaged when you talk about social development i think the biggest the guiding question is here how does PWS impact their attention and their engagement in the classroom, their ability to cope with frustration and their emotional functioning? So I listed off a bunch of different variables that might be there. Um, so, you know, what do they do to cope? Um, are they the kid that just kind of sits back and lets everything happen? Or do they get really upset really quickly and get really frustrated? Um, if hyperphagia is something that's kicked in for your family already and your child, um, how do they respond around food? Um, does it make them anxious? Do they get really, really focused on it? Do they have those perseverative behaviors where it has to just the same thing is still happening over and over and over? The questions that are happening over and over and over again. And if you've got that, what are you doing to kind of break the cycle or what works for you? Is it somebody who's really rigid, like things have got to be the same way every time, or you're going to see some real um, emotional upset? How do they get along with other kids? Um, all those things can really play out within the classroom. So just to kind of get you thinking a little bit, I'll give you an example of something that, you know, over the years I've been helping to write um, my daughter Noelle's IEPs. So for her, in terms of her social engagement, when she was younger, I had said, Noelle's generally an affectionate and easygoing little girl. She loves to be a helper and enjoys engaging with peers. She tends to mother other children by pointing out behavioral expectations. Um, that was a very nice way of saying that she liked to tell everybody what to do and how to do it. But um, expressive language difficulties can interfere with her ability to communicate with peers and adults, even those familiar with her. She can be rigid in her approach to tasks and will refuse to engage in tasks or activities if pushed into a power struggle. She responds well to routine and is quick to point out when there's variation in that routine. If an activity or reward has been planned or promised, she will be insistent that it occur. Behavioral expectations should be clearly stated as she responds best when she understands expectations and consequences. So you, when you look at all those things, you could see how they could really keep her either functioning well in a classroom or could really start to interfere with how she's doing in a classroom. The physical development section of the IEP is definitely one where a lot of things could come up for Prodder Willie. Um, so my kind of guiding question is, in addition to motor skills, because obviously we all think about those fine and gross motor skills, how does the syndrome impact energy levels and endurance for tasks, and what should staff be aware of medically? So obviously, like I said, you've got the fine and the gross motor skills, and even you need to differentiate at times with motor planning. So it's not so much can they perform a skill, but um, can they figure out how to do new things without multiple repetitions of how to do that skill? Um, one of the things I just realized as I'm looking at my slide is I didn't include endurance. Um, how many of our kids can do something the first time or two, but then they're just exhausted and they can't sustain the skill. Um, so it'll look good in the moment, but then it's gone. Signs of illness. Um, most of our kids do not show their Ill signs of illness the way um, most kids do. Um, you know, obviously the issues with temperature regulation and uh, vomiting, uh, the the high pain threshold, all of those things where, you know, you look at your child in the classroom and they're not going to let on that they need something the way some of the other kids need to. Um, scoliosis could definitely impact whether or not a kid can participate in all those activities that other kids are doing. Um, can they play on the playground? Do they have to be monitored more carefully? Um, are they in a brace? Um, those things are all really relevant. Daytime sleepiness. Um, do they need breaks if they're really fatigued? Do they need a chance to take a nap? Um, do they need an activity to get them up and moving and get them just re-regulated and going again and engaged in instruction? Um, things that people might just want to be aware of, you know, the kids who have the really thick saliva and aren't drinking as much. Um, kids who have gastrointestinal issues, you know, what should people watch for? Um, if there's a chance that a child's going to be in distress, uh, temperature regulation, you know, do you need to know if it's, if you're going to go outside to play, you know, is it too hot, too cold? 
uh, that reduced metabolism, I think, is good to know, and I'll include it on an example that I just share in a minute. Um, but also skin picking, obviously, that can be a little overwhelming um, to people if they're not aware that that could be going on. And then obviously, you know, that hyperphagia and the food seeking. So at Noelle's early age, you know, we, we didn't have a really good handle on some of her food seeking to, to understand what it looked like. Um, but we built in some statements. So her IEP when she was very young said that, you know, she's been diagnosed with Prader-Willi syndrome. Hallmark characteristics of the syndrome include food seeking behaviors in combination with a slowed metabolism. As a result, her caloric intake is carefully monitored. Noelle does not run fevers and rarely vomits. If her behavior seems off, you notice an increase in her food seeking or she blanches suddenly. These are your best signs that she is not feeling well. She also has a relatively high pain threshold. So a lot of different variables that, um, and I know that sometimes school districts will be like, well, that's medical. We shouldn't really be talking about it. You know, why should this be in there? But the reality is for our kids, if you're not aware of these things, um, they can be put in a situation where they're not actively engaged in their classrooms. So either they're falling behind their peers, they're falling asleep, um, they need additional supervision, um, their attention's just gone because of the fact that they've got other things going on. So you need to really make sure that you're helping to regulate them me uh, medically in order for them to fully participate in the classroom. In terms of management, um, the management section really looks at how does the classroom need to be organized, structured, or what additional interventions might be provided or needed. Um, so is additional supervision needed? Um, obviously, you want to keep an eye on every preschooler, um, but most kids with Prader really tend to need additional supervision. So when do they need that additional supervision? What does that look like? Um, does their classroom need to be set up so that things are out of reach, um, not available? Um, for Noelle, you know, she couldn't have, she would very happily help herself to something out of the garbage can. So the garbage cans weren't staying in the room. Um, she couldn't have food used in instructions. So that could be a number of different things. Are they using food as like a manipulative where, you know, you're counting M&Ms or you're, your problems talk about, you know, apples and oranges, or are they using food as rewards? Um, you really want to make sure that there's consistency between adults, and that includes communication with substitutes. Um, most of these kids can read adults very, very well, so even if they can't verbalize their understanding of things, they often know which adult is going to be the one that might be the most loose with some of the restrictions and uh, or might be what we often called an easy target at my house. Special events, if someone's going to be bringing food into the classroom, um, you know, what will that look like? And we really don't want to be looking at just having our kids be excluded or exempted. So how are they going to look at that? Um, if something's coming in, will they uh, give you the chance to have an alternate activity or food or should your child be given the opportunity to have what everybody else is having that's kind of a personal discussion um, but how do you promote communication with home as well so that you have some involvement there so for example what we had written into noelle's when she was very young is that noelle should not be allowed to eat anything other than what is provided from home or has been previously approved by her parents she responds well if reminded that she has her own special food rather than simply being told that she cannot have something else. Rewards should be in the form of non-edible items such as stickers or special privileges. All food items in a classroom setting should be secured in a location out of Noelle's reach. During snack and meal times, Noelle needs to be carefully monitored to ensure that she does not beg or take food from her peers. The disposal of leftover food should also be monitored as Noelle will eat food off someone else's plate or out of the trash on occasion. If a craft or art project involves food items, an adult should monitor her work and hand individual items to her as she completes the project in order to prevent her from having the opportunity to eat the materials. The use of typically non-edible items that could be mistaken as edible, such as Play-Doh, should also be monitored. So once you've set up all those different present levels of functioning, then you want to start looking at the rest of the IEP. So talk about what goals should be prioritized with those goals aligning with the student's specific needs outlined in the present levels. 
Um, I would really encourage you to make sure that you don't have lists and lists of uh, goals because the reality is that neither your school nor your child is going to have the time or the energy to be able to meet every goal. So pick the biggies, um, pick things that are overarching, um, pick things that, you know, you're like, you know what, this very feasibly could be attained in the next year and then we'll move on to some of the other things. Um, make sure that you talk about how you'll know when the student has achieved those goals. So what's that going to look like? Um, what services, modifications, and supports for school personnel are needed to help the student meet their goals? Um, so obviously when you're talking about, you know, you may have options for special education teacher services, you might be looking at things like speech or occupational therapy or physical therapy. Um, but sometimes teachers are just, they don't know that this is all new to them and they might need some additional support. Um, you can always talk about writing in resources for training. So um, could they access videos put out by PWSA um, or that you know about? Could you have somebody come in and do a presentation? Could you do a presentation um, to talk about what the syndrome is, what it looks like, and how they might want to modify their environment? It's something that's actually worked out very, very well for us over the years is that we have um, written right into Noel's IEP that uh, support for school personnel is a disability specific training. Um, and during that training, I really make an emphasis as I come in and I kind of talk about what Prader Willy is overall. Um, I talk about what it could be, what they're not necessarily going to see because Noel's not showing every, because none of our kids show every, you know, physical sign or symptom of Prader Willy. Um, and then we talk about her specifically. I really also make an effort to, um, to build relationship um, because what I have found is that in terms of helping them to feel like they're on the same page as you and that you're all working towards helping your student learn versus just telling the, the staff at school what they have to do, um, it definitely tends to go a whole lot further. And then if the goal, I mean, the goal is always to be in the least restrictive environment. You'll hear people toss out the term LRE. Um, and the idea is that we want to see our students have the most experiences and the most opportunities for learning and the most access to the classroom with their non-disabled peers. Um, but what we also really need to look at on the flip side is where is their progress towards their goals going to be best accommodated? Um, and I think that a lot of this is going to come through consultation between you and your early intervention providers and even the people who are sitting on that committee and the people who have done the evaluation. And you're going to want to look at, you know, how does your, your child respond to if there's other kids around? Do they really want to do what the other kids are doing? Are they, you know, feeling like, wow, this could be fun and exciting? And so they're more sold on what's going on. Um, are they completely overwhelmed by what's going on? And so they tend to shut down and detach and they might not be as successful. Um, I think really one of the biggest things that we is, need to look at as parents and providers is where are we seeing the most growth happening and how can we help support that? So um, we wanna see our kids in with non-disabled peers, but if your child's at a point where you're like, wow, they're, they've really just got a lot of, to work on in order to be able to be more successful with their non-disabled peers, it's not necessarily a bad thing to look at a more restrictive environment so that you can master those skills to be able to branch out and be with their peers um, on a more regular basis. So in terms of practical advocacy, what I always talk about with parents and I've always done myself is I've talked about what's my gold standard and what's my acceptable fallback. So when you walk into a meeting, you know what you want. You know what you'd like to ask. Um, you could have things that you really, really want to see happen, but you know that there's definitely a possibility that it might not. Um, I think one of the worst things that we can do as parents um, walking into a meeting is not just having a, a be all and end all and this is the way it's going to be and if it doesn't happen um, then I'm willing to fight. Um, we should always be willing to advocate but when you're walking into some of these meetings sometimes it's good to know here's what I really really want and then kind of have in the back of your mind you know what if it doesn't end up happening I could be okay and this is what we're going to do. Um, 
So for example, um, when Noelle went to school, I really, really wanted her to have a one-to-one -one aid. Um, and I was, I was prepared to, to advocate and to fight for it. But in the back of my mind, I had already said, you know what, if I don't have this happen right away, um, where are the places that I feel it's the most important for her to have additional supervision? Um, so obviously the cafeteria was one of those, or when the kids were eating, or if there were activities where, you know, she might not be able to keep up with somebody or she might get lost or sidetracked. Um, and so I went in and I was fully prepared to say, you know what, this is what I really, really want. I want that full-time one-to-one aid. Um, but in the back of my head, I had kind of remembered I could be okay if I have to fall back. And then I could have ask questions about, okay, if I have to go to my fallback, how do we collect data and to say, this is how I know that this is what she needs. Um, so for example, if I had not ended up having Noelle have that full-time one-to-one aid, I would have said, okay, so here are the behaviors that I think are going to show up if she doesn't have somebody, you know, fully attentive to her needs. Um, you know, I, I see, you know, some of these behaviors in terms of food seeking, stealing, um, taking things that don't belong to her. Um, and I want you to do data collection on that. And if these things are happening on a regular basis, then we need to come back and talk because clearly the recommendation wasn't successful and we need to make some changes. Um, and then I would set a time frame for when that might happen. Daytime sleepiness might be another example of this. Um, a lot of times they don't want to just say, oh yeah, well, they're going to take a nap. Um, so if you, if you don't have something to address that built in, you might say, okay, I, I really want to know how often are they falling asleep? How long is this lasting for? Um, when do you, you know, how much is that keeping them from paying attention in class? How much classwork are they missing out on? There again, it gives you a chance to come back and make that informed decision. And then really, I always, I put document, document. Um, one of the things that you can do is not necessarily in, in an adversarial way, but I would always, if I had a conversation where I felt like somebody might not necessarily remember it, I would send up a follow, a follow-up email where I'd say, hey, thanks so much for talking with me today. You know, I, I'm really grateful that we're going to be doing this and this. Um, knowing that we're going to be looking at monitoring, you know, such and such a behavior. Um, you know, I, I really appreciate the fact that you're going to be and then lay out exactly what you talked about and then say, here's what I plan to follow up with you. I think one of our biggest problems um, is that when we often trust that, you know, conversations are going to be remembered. Um, and then somebody doesn't remember it the way we do, it often feels a lot more adversarial and confrontational. So just putting it out there in writing in a very positive way give, does give you a point of reference for when you come back later. And the biggest thing I really want to encourage each of you as you go through this is to remember, this is a journey. Um, one of the things that I realized when I went back and looked at some of Noelle's IEPs from when she was younger, is I was like, wow, I did not do a stellar job on that. That is not my best work. Um, so there are things that I've learned and we've tweaked and we've modified over the years. And you know, we've worked through and we've figured out. Um, other times there are things that aren't necessarily of concern to you right now. So for example, if your child is not actively food seeking, you know, you might put a reference to the possibility of this with Prader Willie in your IEP, but if you're not actively food seeking, you may very well say, you know what, uh, it's there, it's not necessarily happening right now, but here are the things to keep an eye out for and get back to me um, if you see some of this. Um, you don't need to cover everything that might possibly be an issue. Um, your, your IEP should really target the things that your child needs right here and now. Also, you know, you're going to meet at least yearly. You're always going to have an annual review. So once a year, you're going to get together. You're going to talk about your child's progress. You're going to talk about their successes. You're going to talk about what things they still need to work on and set new goals um, and look at what makes the most sense going forward. Things are always going to evolve. You're always going to come back and revisit. But there are definitely things that, um, and this is actually my daughter, Noelle. I just love this picture of her. But um, there's things that she's doing now that I never would have dreamed she would do when we started out in preschool. Um, so I would encourage you just to, as you do this, you know, think about where you'd like to go. Think about how you'd like to see your child be successful and what you think they need. But 
really tailor it in based on what you know. And I guess what I would do is awesome. open it up too. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Amy, for your presentation. If you have any questions, please feel free to submit them via the question box on your screen. Um, Amy, to get us started, I was wondering if you have copies of the statements that you've used for Noel that you'd be willing to share with our community to maybe um, copy and adapt for their own IEPs. Absolutely. I, I found that that is one of those things that it's coming. I, I worked hard on my own. I borrowed from other people, so I'm more than happy to share those out so they can be modified, tweaked, adapted. But definitely we can do that. Awesome. That's fantastic. And while our attendees are typing out some questions, um, I do have a few more for you. Sure. Um, when you, you sure. <laughs> so when you were talking about um, documenting everything, what do you recommend people catalog or keep on file in regards to their child's IEP? Are there any specific things that they may want to hold on to for the future? Yeah, um, I do think it's a wise idea. And this would be be having each of you do things that I haven't necessarily been stellar at myself. Um, but I think that having a binder or a file folder where you keep a copy of any medical reports that are really relevant, um, copies of any of your child's educational evaluations and their most recent IEP um, will definitely be invaluable. Um, if you do need to have some of those ongoing conversations in terms of documentation, um, in terms of having dialogue and question, um, I would keep those um, emails printed at either, you know, put them in a file or put them, print them and put them in your, uh, your binder just so that you have a place to go back and look if you ever need to have a conversation down the road. And speaking of conversations down the road, what are some things that parents can do to um, talk to the next steps about maybe reevaluating or changing an IEP if they realize that it's not working for their child? Absolutely. I would say start with um, your teachers. Ask what, you know, if they have any concerns, if there's anything that they would bring up, because a lot of times they're going to be the advocate that you're working with to have discussions about adding services. Um, and at the preschool level, unfortunately, in early intervention, they have those, you know, the service coordinators and you have a point person. Um, at least in New York, and I believe this is true across most of the country, um, the chairperson for the Committee on Preschool Special Education becomes kind of the point person or the contact person. Um, so you would reach out to the preschool special education department in your school district. Um, and just basically, if you have concerns about reevaluation or another meeting, you can just request it. Um, if you put it in writing, obviously it doesn't get lost in translation or anything, but um, you just want to reach out to your school district and request either a reevaluation in the area that you're concerned about or a meeting to discuss your concerns. Thank you. And speaking of um, having the point person, who else can parents expect to see at their initial IEP meeting for their child? Um, this, I think it varies a little bit state to state, but I think that typically you should always see a school district representative. Um, you should always see a regular education teacher. Um, if your child is receiving special education services, they should have a special education teacher there. Um, and then it really will depend on the different involvements. Some people have, um, some states have municipality representatives where um, basically the organization that kind of oversees the provision of services um, also works along with the school district. So they might be there. Um, you as a parent always have the right to invite anybody. So say, for example, you really feel like your early intervention provider should be there. They know your child, they've been working with them and they just don't happen to be on the invitation to the meeting. Um, you have every right to invite other people to come to a meeting. So if there's someone that you feel should be there that isn't, um, absolutely reach out um, to the school district and tell them, hey, I want to invite so-and-so, but then also do some of the legwork yourself um, to make sure that they're invited. And speaking of inviting people to the IEP, is it um, a wise decision to maybe invite a friend or a grandma or someone else that you trust to come with you to take notes or record the conversation in case you miss anything? Is that an appropriate thing to ask? Certainly. If you're feeling really stressed, um, it's always a good thing. I would I'd encourage you to always let you know your school district know in advance that you're doing that. 
uh, more of a, is a sign of good faith than anything else. Um, just to let them know, you know, hey, I'm stressed. I'm just really needing some support and invite them to come along with you. Um, be very careful, though, with recording. Um, you cannot legally record without the other person knowing. Um, so that's definitely, I know that some people um, fall into that trap. They think, oh, it just, it makes sense to me. That's the only way I'm going to remember. Um, but it definitely sends a, a message that, you know, it either might be legal action down the road. Might not be your intent, but it's definitely the message that it sends to a school district. <laughs> so um, if you have any thoughts that you want to record it, I would bring it up. Um, but a lot of times uh, I would say that you're better off inviting a friend or a family member to come along and support you versus um, whipping out your cell phone and just saying, hey, I want to record this. Great. Um, Sarah has a question. Her daughter is having her first IEP meeting via Zoom next Wednesday, and um, her daughter is turning three in June. How exciting. She is the only child with TBS <laughs> currently in their school district. So how should Sarah go about conveying the food as a disability aspect? Um, what I would definitely talk about is, um, and one of the statements that I'll include, um, is that I talk a lot about food anxiety. And I talk about how if our kids are really, really focused on, you know, what they might eat, when they might get it, um, it completely distracts them and behaviorally takes them away from the classroom. So whether it's behaviorally, they're just not, you know, they're off across the room trying to get something, or if they're just sitting at circle, but they're looking somewhere else it completely takes the emphasis off learning. So you really want to say, you know, look, I know everyone's goal here is to make sure that, you know, she's learning and she's gaining from the classroom instruction. And so because the drive for food is so intense, um, everything we can do to diminish that drive um, or the opportunities for that drive to be a distraction, um, that's what we want to do if we want to promote learning. Thank you. Um, and one final question. What can parents do at home to support their child's IEP? Uh, and that's such a tricky one because I think that you're going to be doing things day in and day out. Um, and a lot of times our kids are just exhausted by the time they get home. Um, so I know that there were times that my daughter just worked and worked and worked and she got home and she would just pass out. She would just fall asleep on the floor. So a lot of times what I really try to do is encourage parents to, you know, certainly ask, you know, your your teacher, ask your classroom, ask your speech or OT or PT person, you know, is there something that we can do to encourage them to do stuff at home? Um, but unless there's something really pressing, I would encourage parents to, you know, take opportunities for social time, for, you know, just reading, sitting, playing. Um, modeling how to ask questions, um, just kind of more foster a love of learning um, than worrying about being a therapist outside of school. Um, it sounds kind of like, eh, don't worry about it, and that's not really where I'm going, but I, we want to make sure that our kids have the energy to give when they get to school. Um, so if you can enjoy the family time and just foster, like I said, that love of learning through just fun activities versus worrying about meeting the IEP goals, um, I think it turns into much more of a wraparound service for your child. Well, thank you, Amy. It doesn't look like we have any more questions from our attendees today. So thank you once again for coming and for doing this very informative presentation. Um, to all of our attendees today, if you have any additional questions for our presenter, please submit them to info at pwsausa.org, and I will forward your email along to Amy um, you can also keep the conversation going by joining one of our many Facebook support groups. Just send us an email again at info at pwsausa.org if you would like to be added. Um, after the webinar ends, we would invite you to take a brief five-question survey to let us know how we did. A recording of this webinar will be available for anybody who missed today's presentation or would like to watch it again. Thank you again, Amy, for joining us today. And stay safe, everybody. Have a good evening. Thank you so much.